I felt like I couldn't stand there and watch a man that I saw alive two minutes ago not be alive anymore. In the forefront of our minds, that every second it takes for us to get there is a second that that person is fighting. And although our lifeboats are quick, you just want them to go that bit quicker. And a second can mean the difference between life and death. We were probably 50 or 60 metres away and Harrod noticed members of the public on the beach. There was a lot of people um, around someone lying on the floor. With people on the beach performing chest compressions, it's clear that the casualty is in a critical condition. I remember looking over my shoulder at the guys and making a split-second decision. Hold on, we're going on the beach, OK? We decided that a beach landing was the best way to get there as quickly as possible, which would have saved us from having to swim to shore as well. OK, guys, go, go, go. Time is of the essence, and we don't have time. It just turned into a very intense moment. Your body is full of adrenaline, especially when it comes to the situation that we were in. The bystanders tell the crew that the casualty has been dragged lifeless from the water. How long was he in the water for? When we reached him, he was face down in the water and completely unresponsive. And we rolled him over, and I remember taking one look at him and thinking, we haven't reached him in time, we were too late. Someone checked for a pulse and whether he was breathing, but he was showing no signs. So we started CPR straight away. Every time that you put any pressure on his chest, there was water coming from his mouth. There was no movement, there was nothing. We're fighting for this guy's life. Laying eyes on the casualty really didn't fill me with any hope at all. I thought we were too late and we'd lost him. And then all of a sudden, he took a breath. Just absolute relief. The paramedics arrived and assessed him and got him onto the stretcher. We suspect his name to be Mr. Michael Hall. I remember looking at the crew and each and every one of them being exhausted and almost shell shocked. Welcome back. By what we'd just been through in the last 20 minutes or so. You all right? I've never, I've never done that before, ever. It's not all about. As soon as those doors closed, took a big sigh of relief, knowing that we've done as best as we can. We obviously didn't know whether he was going to survive the journey, let alone in hospital. It was the following day we got the news that whilst he was still in an induced coma, things were looking very good and he was likely to make a full recovery. I don't have any memory of being swept out to sea. The last thing I recall is going face first into the water. My only thought was, well, that's it. And then everything went black. Mike had driven to Porth Call from his home an hour and a half away in the hope of a good day's fishing. I was feeling quite excited. It was a nice day and I waded out into water that was no more than six or eight inches deep. As Mike entered the water, he caught the attention of Ailsa, who'd come down to the Oakmore with a friend. He was stood in the middle of the estuary, um, probably about knee deep in the water. As well as the rising tide, after recent heavy rains, the river had swollen and a wall of water was pushing Mike out to sea. He was just appearing as a black shape quite far out in the water. As I ran towards the people that were there, I remember shouting to one of them, has anyone rang the Coast Guard? The last thing I remember is going face first into the waves, and after that, everything's a blur.
I felt like I couldn't stand there and watch a man that I saw alive two minutes ago not be alive anymore. Although by now the Coast Guard had been called, there was no time to lose. Ailsa and another bystander entered the water. I'm a relatively strong swimmer, but the waves were cold, absolutely freezing. And I remember being thrown around all over the place. After fighting through the waves, Ailsa and the other rescuer managed to reach Mike. The man next to me said, he's gone, he's gone. And I remember thinking, we've got to get him out of this water as quickly as we can. Between them, they managed to drag Mike back to the beach, where they attempted to revive him. It amazes me how many people were involved in the rescue. Almost all of them either just members of the public or volunteers. And all of them are responsible for saving my life. I'm extremely grateful for that. It makes you think about everything, puts everything in your life into perspective. They didn't realize how special life is and how sacred it is as well. Well, we're very close to the, the, the spot that I was dragged out of the water, which is just around the corner. It is quite remarkable, really. And although he still enjoys fishing, Mike's now more aware of his surroundings. I guess I'm just a bit more cautious than I was before. If I'd have been a bit more cautious in the first place, it wouldn't have happened. I wear a life jacket, really now, because I see the sense in it. Uh, I should have worn it on the day. It does help to get a bit closer to the fish, but I won't be going any further out. I'm amazed by how lucky I was on the day. Yes, you could say I was unlucky to have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, but if all the other parts hadn't fallen into place, I wouldn't be here now. The standing joke is that I'm using up my nine lives. I mean, the trouble is we don't know which one we're on. And because nobody started counting. <laughs>